John G. Payton, 1824 to 1907. And I first read his autobiography when I was 22. Through the intervening years, time to time, we go back to him, and I had to go back to him for this conference, and it's done the power of good to do that. In some ways, our lives interconnected with Peyton, not directly, of course, you understand, we're not quite that old, but Peyton went from Scotland to Australia, and then from Australia, 1,400 miles out into the South Pacific, we'll talk about that a little later. But we went from Scotland to Sydney to Australia too. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't continue the journey then. But in Sydney, I had the great privilege of being the successor in the pastorate I was in to J.G. Miller, who had been a missionary in the very area where Peyton was and who knew Peyton's son, Fred. And from Dr. Miller, I received benediction in many ways, and one of those benedictions was in being drawn closer to Peyton and the missionaries that went out to the South Pacific. So this morning's subject is John G. Peyton. Now, why do we study history? Many reasons, only one briefly. To understand the present. No understanding the world today without understanding history, and without understanding Bible history. Go back to Genesis chapter 10, when man, in the early days of history, is rising up after the fall in rebellion against God. In the 10th chapter, Genesis tells us how God came down to humble men and to scatter and confound them by their languages. Countless languages came into existence, and people were spread far across the earth. And some went as far as the middle of the Pacific. How they got there, no one can be sure, except, of course, by small boats, but they did. And in one of the islands which they arrived at, uh, the island that we're talking about today, the islands, I should say, some 80 islands in the South Pacific, which today are called Vanuatu, and which we, from history, call the New Hebrides. And those people in those far-off parts of the earth were totally isolated from civilization for millennia. And then in the year 1774, a Yorkshireman called Captain Cook, encircling the world on his boat, the Resolution, landed in the New Hebrides. He gave the islands the name, the New Hebrides. And when he came back, his voyages were published and drew attention to that unknown part of the world. And when people first heard about the New Hebrides and the people there, there were two very different reactions. Some people thought, what a wonderful thing to live in such a peaceful part of the world, simple lives, untouched with the problems of civilization. What noble people there must be to live there. That was one response. And as you well know, and especially those of us so fresh from the morning session, you know that that interpretation was totally false. What happens to people without the light of God's word? They descend into darkness and degradation. And that was the position in the New Hebrides. Psalm 74 says, the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. People of the New Hebrides, totally cut off from biblical light, fell into all the sin and crime of Romans chapter 1. They were heathen in the darkest sense of the word. When the evangelization of the Pacific began, Samoa was one of the starting points, and God blessed witness in Samoa. And from Samoa, in 1839, a small group moved to the New Hebrides and landed on the island of Eromanga. The leader was John Williams. He was killed on the beach and his friend killed with him and eaten. Cannibal Islands. Eromanga, 1839. One effect of that was that the Christians in Samoa moved with compassion for these poor, benighted people. And numbers of the Samoan Christians volunteered to come with 
missionaries back to the New Hebrides. And a group came around 1850, led by a Scotsman called John Geddy, onto the island of Anichum, which is in the southern part of the New Hebrides. And after a few years, helped by these Samoan Christians, a real work of grace was started in Anichum. Anichum became almost a kind of Antioch in the South Pacific. It was a starting point. Geddy then wrote back to Scotland and pleaded for men to be sent, or couples, married couples, to be sent. His appeal went to the Reformed Presbyterian Church, quite a small denomination just with 40 congregations. And no ministers responded. But John G. Payton, who had been helping evangelistic work in Glasgow and had just finished his training for the ministry, he volunteered. 1858, he married Mary Robson. She was only 18. And they sailed. He was 33. They sailed for Sydney and then out to the New Hebrides. First to Anichum, where they met up with Geddy and these other Christians, and then they were recommended, set apart for the island of Tanna, where there was no missionary light. There had been attempts before for Christians to stay there, but none had succeeded. So Peyton and his wife and another couple went in the late year 1858. They were surrounded with many dangers instantly. One had to do with health. They first established a little home fairly near the beach on the island of Tanner. Tanner, I should say, had a population probably of about three and a half thousand. It was an island of some 40 miles in circumference. And there they set up home. But they had arrived at the worst possible time of year. It was the middle of the rainy season. Mary, his wife, was pregnant. Malaria was rife. And after giving birth to their little boy Peter, she died on March the 3rd of the following year. And just a few weeks later, on March the 20th, their little boy Peter died also. When she was dying, Peyton says, she said, Oh, that my dear mother were here. She is a good woman, my mother, a jewel of a woman. But then she observed someone in the room that she didn't know was there, and she said, you must not think I regret coming here and leaving my mother. If I had the same thing to do over again, I would do it with far more pleasure. Yes, with all my heart. Oh, no, I do not regret leaving home and friends. Though at the time I felt it keenly. And when she died, her last words were, not lost, only gone before forever with the Lord. Well, health was a major danger, but a still greater danger was the character of the people of the island. Several tribes, different chiefs, all unregenerate men and women. And as soon as the truth was exposed to them, the antagonism of the natural man, the carnal mind, you remember, is enmity against God. The enmity was, in, in a sense, not so much against the missionaries, but against the message and the truth that they preached. They were totally incapable of trust. They might say one thing and do immediately the other. They fought among themselves. They were so inured to cruelty and cheapness of life, abortion, all kinds of depravity. Peyton says he was dismayed at first to think of the people he'd left at home to come to such a situation. But God gave him grace. And God gave him the help of some Anichamese Christians who had come from Anichim with him to help him. They were outstanding couples. One of them was a man named Namuri, and he was killed on Tanna within a few years. Uh, he lived in a house, a little house, of course, just close to Peyton's mission house. When he was first attacked, Peyton urged him to come and stay in the mission and not to move amongst the natives as he'd been doing, but no, he refused. He said, Missy, they call the missionaries Missy, Missy, when I see them thirsting for my blood, 
I just see myself when the missionary first came to my island. I desired to murder him as they now desire to kill me. Had he stayed away from such danger, I would have remained a heathen. But he came and continued coming till by the grace of God I was changed to what I am. I cannot stay away from them, but I will sleep at the mission house and do all I can to bring them to Jesus. Well, it was only a few weeks later that Namuri was so badly stoned that he could only drag himself to the mission house where he died in Peyton's arms. Pain and suffering were great. And he bore it all very quietly. And he kept saying, for the sake of Jesus, for Jesus' sake. He was constantly praying for his persecutors. O oh Lord Jesus, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. O oh, take not away thy servants from Tanner. Take not away thy worship from this dark island. O oh God, bring all the Tannies to love and follow Jesus. And then Peyton says, to him, Jesus was all and in all, and there were no bands in his death. He passed from us in the assured hope of entering into the glory of the Lord. Well, physical danger, and Peyton, of course, faced that himself often. There isn't a clear picture of what he looked like as a young man, but I think we can be very confident he was pretty strong and healthy. He had one device these natives were very quick-tempered and hot-tempered. And sometimes they would do things instantly which they repented of. And so when more than one occasion a, a musket, as they call them, was leveled at him and he was threatened with him, if he could, if he was uh, near enough, he would throw himself into the arms of the person and hold them so tight that they couldn't fire anything and he'd hold them till they cooled down. He did that more than once. Once he went to visit, he was asked to visit a dying man in his hut, and uh, here was the man laid out on this sort of grass stretcher. And as they were talking, the man was working with his hand in the thatch of the roof, and what was he doing? He was pulling out a knife. He had been deputed to kill Peyton, and he was a, he thought, the people thought this was a, the right man to do it. Peyton was able to stop him. That was the sort of situation that they lived in physical danger. And then, sad to say, one of the worst dangers of all were white people, traders, who were going to and forth among the islands without any remote interest in the people or their welfare, but willing to plunder whatever they could, and particularly sandalwood had been discovered. It's very valuable for furniture in Europe, and so these were sandalwood traders. They were, for the most part, godless men and women, totally depraved. And um, the evidence is fairly clear that they were responsible for, for spreading measles amongst the islands. People had never had measles before, and hundreds of them died. So the, these combination of dangers, and you can understand that when the people made no distinction between white people, whether they were Christians or not, and when this plague of measles came in, and many of them died, they blamed the Christians, the gods that had come into the islands and their own gods were displeased and so on. So it came to a crisis in January of 1862. One morning, Peyton was in his mission station. Another missionary, a man called Johnson, had joined them. He was with Peyton. And two men came in. They looked menacing, but they said they had just come for medicine. They were given the medicine, but as they were about to leave one of them suddenly turned and swung his murderous club to hit Johnson. Johnson fell. Whether the club hit him or not, he went down. But Johnson was so shaken by what had happened that he died within two weeks of that event. And then, later that month, Peyton's little house was attacked at night. First of all, many natives broke into their storeroom, stripped it of all his possessions, he had gone into the inner bedroom with old Abraham. Old Abraham, those of you who read the book, you know who he was. He was an, a Nietzsche Christian who had come with Peyton, with his wife. And he stuck with Peyton. Wherever Peyton was, old Abraham was with him. 
here they were in the bedroom. The natives broke in, and at that point, after prayer, Peyton's only other resource was his revolver. He raised it and pointed at them. He had no bullets. He had no intention of shooting anyone that he'd come to help. But he did raise his revolver, and at the sight of it, they departed for the moment. And Peyton knew that from what had happened, they'd be back in the next morning. The only thing to do then was to cross over to the other side of the island where there was another missionary couple, the Mathesons, hopeful that the tribes, you know, these different tribes, some of them were more peaceful and hopeful that it would be quieter there. So the next morning, uh, I'm shortening the story, in between he had to spend one night sleeping most of the night up in a tree. But he finally got across to the Mathesons. They welcomed him. Uh, but hostile tribes and people followed. With one other helper that Peyton had with him, uh, and his name was Cluther, and he was four-legged. He was a dog, but he was very helpful. And while they were in the Matheson's house, they'd only been there about two weeks, one night at 10 o'clock, the dog jumps up onto Peyton's bed, pulls his, whatever was covering him, and uh, Peyton knew what the signal was. Goes to the window, and sure enough, here are men all round, fire sticks in their hands, torches lit, and they are burning the church, which was next to the mission house, and joined from the mission house to the, to the church was a, a, a fence, a brushwood fence, and they were about to set light to the bushwood, bushwood f- fence, and which would engulf the whole mission house. Peyton then tells the Mathesons he's going out to lock the door behind me. Out he goes with a tomahawk in one hand and his empty revolver in the other. Gets to the fence and where the fire is coming across, it breaks it all down for a fire break. But he's instantly surrounded with men with all kinds of weapons. And now, at this moment, a tornado comes up through this little village. Yes, at that very moment. Noise, and uh, I haven't heard a tornado, but I've heard something like it in Australia, comes with a great rushing sound, and then torrential rain. That's exactly what happened. Rain poured down. All the little fire sticks were all smothered in a moment, and these natives said, it's Jehovah's rain. It's Peyton's God's rain. They were delivered. The next morning... The attackers come back, and at that point, not rain, but a shout is raised, Sail ho! Out at sea was a ship coming in. Sure enough, it was a ship from the Nietium, and Peyton and the missionaries, the Mathesons, with great difficulty, were taken off. With great difficulty, because Mr. Matheson was determined to stay, but uh, the situation was impossible. So leaving all behind them, his possessions that had been stolen on Tanner and everything else, with a old Abraham and with the dog Cluther, they went back to Anichum. That's in the beginning of the year, 1862. He was welcomed back, and after prayer, the decision was that for his health's sake and for the sake of the mission, Peyton should go to Australia and there seek to arouse the Christian churches to the greatness of the need and the opportunity. So that's what happened. And for the next, at least a whole year, Peyton traveled to some 400 spots in Australia. Not an easy thing to do. Not the time of railroads, not even proper roads in many places. Often on foot. At first, he was unknown. In Sydney, he asked whether he could speak uh, in a church once or twice. And he was, first of all, people said, well, who is this man? But as soon as they heard him, Christians rallied to him and uh, to the message. And part of his burden was to raise support for a ship that could carry supplies to the islands and carry missionaries. At the present, at that time, they were dependent on these white trade traders who were often the very people that they wanted to have nothing to do with. So a ship was a great need, and Peyton in Australia launched. Christian Shipping Company. And for a penny, 
children could join the shipping company and they would get shares in the company and they would be able to buy a ship. He loved children and he not only spoke to large congregations but often to children and hundreds of children became members of this Christian shipping company and within two or three years they had enough to build a ship, the day spring. Well, then the question was, it was put to him, he should go back to Scotland for a while to awaken concern in Scotland. What had happened in Australia uh, could happen in Scotland. But he was very disinclined to do that. And I think it was about the only time in his life that he actually cast lots whether he should go back to Scotland or go back at once to the New Hebrides. The lot said, go home. So he went back to Scotland. And it was quite clearly of God's ordering. People were stirred to hear what had been experienced and what the need was. And uh, by the time he left, it was said that every home in his denomination had a collecting box for the day spring. And people were aroused. And also, in God's mercy, he was given uh, another wife, Margaret, who was to be with him the remainder of their lives, almost the remainder. So they finally go back to Australia and then to Anitium, 1866. And this time, although he wanted to go back to Tanner, the universal opinion of the missionary, missionaries was that it certainly wasn't safe to do so. So they go to another island called Aniwa, Aniwa. And uh, they were to be there for 15 years. As they came to the shore, Margaret Payton, his bride, she said she saw black faces peering at us from among the rocks and without a flicker of a smile of welcome on their faces, I wondered if they were thirsting for our blood. Well, she was nervous. They weren't. Um, Payton said the natives received us kindly. Well, they did. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, the kindness didn't go very deep. Their first home was just a roof uh, and a floor. With that, the walls round, and their bodies weren't in any danger from the natives, but their possessions certainly were. If they weren't looking, anything could be lifted and carried away. They said the people were found of two different types, some very shy and distrustful, and others forward and imperious. They, learning from the mistake of building in the wrong place, Peyton chose a site as high up on the island as he could get uh, for a home. Higher up from the mosquitoes and so on, the better. But the natives refused to let him have that uh, site for reasons they never gave. But they said, well, there was another spot higher, also high, he could have, and they showed him where it was. When he began digging there, the foundations, he very quickly ran into a lot of human bones. And so he asked the natives, where did these come from? And they said, ah, we are not Tanner men. We are not Tanner men. We don't eat the bones. And only later did he learn that they had deliberately given him this site because they believed that their gods would be very uh, disturbed at having anyone build on a sacred site and this would be the end of the patents and then they could quietly take all their possessions and so on. They only learned that much later on. So this is the island of Aniwa. And here, the grace of God working sovereignly. Same kind of people, same degradation, but grace coming in. And the first one in whom the grace was found was the brother of a man who had tried to shoot Peyton. And this man who came in as a believer was a man called Nemaki. And even on the island of Aniwa, the Peytons drank tea at four o'clock or thereabouts in the afternoon. And this chief, Namaki, he got interested in the tea drinking. And he came along, and he liked the tea. And so he came again. And then the next time he came, he brought another chief with him and the chief's wife, the three of them. And in the mercy of God, these three were the first to confess Christ. From being savage cannibals, they rose before our eyes under the influence of the gospel. 
into noble and beloved characters and they and we loved each other exceedingly. So that was the beginning. The majority was still hostile and sometimes this man and the others at night would stay awake round Peyton's house with buckets of water in case anyone came to set it on fire. The turning point is an interesting one and particularly interesting for those of you who saw the film last night. The connection is this. On the island of Aniwa, in the rainy season from November through to April, but plenty of rainwater. But for the rest of the year, very scarce. They had to use um, sugar cane and um, coconut milk and so on. Water was very scarce. But there were two wells which collected water in some way and they were owned by the priests, sacred men. And the sacred men claimed that they had the power to put water in the wells or not. And of course, you had to supply gifts to help the water to come and that's how things operated. So Peyton thought, if he could drive a well down for fresh water, it would be a wonderful thing. And he resolved to make the attempt. He knew he'd have to go down at least 30 feet. So he started. And at first he had the help of some of the native people. They needed, um, they needed paying for it, of course. You don't pay them in money, they, they couldn't have anything with it. But fish hooks, they value it, and the men like fish hooks. So Peyton had fish hooks, and for helping him to dig, they had got fish hooks. Well, that went all right until they'd gone down about 12 feet. At that point, sides, one of the sides, fell in. And thereafter, no native would go down this fish again. Peyton met the problem by trees. Two trees were cut down and established as posts at the top of the well. A cross beam was put in and all looked solid. But even these few Christians, Namaki, the Christian chief, he said, said to Peyton, you must not do this. The people will think you are mad. They will never listen to you again. Rain, they said, Missy, rain comes down from heaven. Rain doesn't come up from the ground. They see you digging. They think you're off your head. That's what they did think. They never, never heard of such a thing as a well that would bring up water from the bottom. From that point, from 12 feet down to 30 feet, Peyton had to dig on his own. And when he had just got a little over 30 feet, there was indications of water coming through. Now, he wasn't certain they wouldn't strike salt water. And Namaki was afraid that when he struck the water, he'd be straight into the ocean and be eaten by the sharks. But he struck fresh water. And the next day after the first signs of water, he was able to bring up a cup of water to the top of the well and hand it to Namaki, touch it with his finger, shake it. It was water. Namaki, the chief, then summons all the people and he preaches to them in his own way. He preaches to them from the top of the well. He says, wonderful is the work of this Jehovah God. No God on Aniwa ever answered prayers as Missy's God has done. And then, beating his hand on his chest, something here in my heart tells me that Jehovah God does exist. The invisible one, whom we never heard of nor saw till Missy brought him to our knowledge. Well, in the providence of God, that well was a turning point. People began to listen. Peyton had started church services, and people had come, but they lay on their backs, they smoked, they chatted, there was very little attention. But from this point, people began to listen. And Saturday became the cooking day, because the next day was the Lord's Day, the Sabbath day, and they learned that God had blessed men from creation by making one day in seven holy, and that this was a great privilege to be kept by those who knew him. And so the Lord's Day became established on Aniwa. And then, two years later, the first baptisms and communion service. Peyton spent about two years preparing those who were professing to be ready to profess Christ, and Namaki and other Christians, there were some 20 in all. He says the conditions of attendance at this early stage were explicit. 
and had to be made very severe, and only 20 were admitted to the roll. At the final examination, only 12 gave evidence of understanding what they were doing and of having given their hearts to the service of the Lord Jesus. At their own urgent desire, and after every care in examining and instructing, they were solemnly dedicated to be baptized and admitted to the Lord's table. On that Lord's day, after the usual open, uh, opening service, I gave a short and careful exposition of the Ten Commandments and the way of salvation according to the Gospel. The twelve candidates then stood up before the, all the inhabitants there assembled, and after a brief exhortation to them as converts, I put to them two questions. Do you, in accordance with your profession of the Christian faith and your promises before God and the people, wish me now to baptize you? And will you live henceforth for Jesus only, hating all sin and trying to love and serve your Savior? Well, here were twelve baptized young Christians and nine or ten of them had been murderers before they became Christians. It was a wonderful beginning. Peyton was moved to the depth of his being. Now, I must move on quickly because uh, time flies. In this. Fifteen years on Aniwa and then by 1880 uh, they had, Mrs. Peyton had lost two Infants who died, uh, her health was broken, 1880, they go back to Australia. And then they're commissioned to go back to Britain. He was back in Britain from 1884 for nearly four years. And that proved very important in a way that he hadn't thought of. His brother, who was a pastor in Glasgow, his brother suggested to him that Peyton should write an account of what had happened in the New Hebrides. And Peyton said, it could not be, it should not be. He dismissed the thought. But then it was laid on his heart. And the result was, in 1888, a volume of his autobiography was published. The remarkable thing about that autobiography is that it only covered the years to the, the time that they had to flee from Tanner. Just those four years. So it really was a record, not of victory and conversions and churches. It, in a sense, it was a record of defeat, certainly of hardship, but also of faith in Christ and of the steadfastness of those who were Christians, like old Abraham. And that book had a remarkable effect. 18,000 copies were sold within a few years, and then a second part was added, which carried on the story. But it opened a, a whole world to people that knew nothing of the South Pacific. And it opened a new vision of evangelistic, true evangelistic work. So prior to this event, Peyton had only been known really in parts of Scotland. But after that, he became known worldwide. Spurgeon wanted him down in London and spoke to some of Spurgeon's, many of Spurgeon's young people. And when Spurgeon introduced him, he introduced him as the king of the cannibals. And uh, two American presidents wanted to see him. He was in the States, Peyton was in the States in the 1890s. He spoke with two presidents. Um, doors were opened, and his book, which you have there in the book room, uh, became available worldwide. Let me throw in a kind of word or two. What sort of man Peyton was? He was a humble man, a big-hearted man, a warm-hearted man. He was a favorite with children. One occasion rather amuses me. He was in the, uh, the home of strangers, and uh, as he sat down in their living room, one little child came and jumped on his knee and treated him like an old friend and said to Peyton, I know you. And uh, Peyton was very puzzled at this, but then he discovered the reason. She said her father, in his study, had his picture. Well, he didn't, but what he actually had was a supposed painting of Moses and the child looking at Peyton's long beard. This is Moses, come! <laughs> so, but he was. Uh, he was a great lover of children, and, and they responded to it, and as I've told you, they became real contributors with their pennies to the dayspring. And although it was very little, 
numbers of them contributed in Australia, in Scotland and elsewhere, and uh, that made it possible. He was a man of much energy and strength. Um, when he was turned 80, he was still chopping down trees and things like that. I'm impressed by the care that he took with other people's money. You know, he had to raise money, but he was very particular how he spent a penny on himself. Sometimes he'd sleep in the open air rather than pay what a hotel wanted in Australia. He, he was just a thoroughly serious, earnest Christian. Now then, um, I want to move on to lessons from his life. Taking you as far as 1880, when he went back to England, the book was published, back to Australia, once or twice, or more than that, he went between Sydney and the islands, of course, and by now he was well over 60 years of age. The last visit to Aniwa was in 1904, when he was, what was he, when he was in his 80th year. Mrs. Peyton died in 1905, and Peyton died two years later in Melbourne, Australia, 1907. Lessons from his life. First lesson, the great lesson. It's the power of the Word of God. Power of the Word of God. It's not what he did or what other missionaries did. It's what Luke says in the Acts of the Apostles. The Word of God grew and multiplied. That's it. It's God using his word. Is not my word like as a hammer, God says, that breaketh the rock in pieces. One of the missionaries on Anitium said this, Before the missionaries came to this island, many white people came here, and some of them talked a great deal to you. But you remained as you were. Your hearts were not changed. And why? Because it was only the words of man like striking the stone with a piece of wood. But when the missionaries came, they brought the hammer, the word of God, and they struck the stone with this hammer. They applied the word of God to your heart. They translated the word of God into your language. They read it to you. They taught you to read it. You read it yourselves. You committed portions of it to memory. You believed it. You obeyed it. It broke your stony heart. It brought your heart into a new shape. You gave up your heathenism. You accepted Christ as your Savior and took God's law as the rule of your lives. It's a very good description. The word of God grew and multiplied. Peyton says, The Holy Spirit wrote the simple promises of the Bible upon the hearts of the first converts in a way which helped them through all difficulties. Now, it is an amazing thing. I didn't take much time describing you the darkness, the demonic, appalling situation, real heathenism. What can enter such a situation? The word of God. The word of God, alive and powerful. And it made the converts effective Christians, bright believers, happy in life and death. Listen to these words of one of the early converts uh, when he was dying. He said, After I am gone, let there be no bad talk, no heathen ways. Sing Jehovah's songs and pray to Jesus and bury me as a Christian. I am dying happy and going to be with Jesus. And who among you will take my place? Now let my last work on earth be this. We will read a chapter from the book. We'll verse about, and then I will pray for you all. And the missy will pray for me, and God will let me go while the song is still sounding in my heart. Just one typical Christian. And then old Abraham, who I mentioned, when um, Peyton came back the second time to Nietzsche after he had been in Britain, uh, Peyton had died in the meantime, and his dog Tutha had died too. And he found that, Peyton, that uh, Abraham had left his watch for Peyton uh, with this message. Give it to my own Missy Peyton and tell him I go to Jesus where time is dead. Isn't that nice? I go to Jesus where time is dead. And Peyton says this about Abraham. That old soul Abraham stood by me as an angel of God 
in sickness and in danger. He went at my side wherever I had to go. He helped me willingly to the last inch of strength in all that I had to do. And it was perfectly manifest that he was doing all this, not from mere human love, but for the sake of Jesus. That man had been a cannibal in his heathen days. But by the grace of God, there he stood, verily a new creature in Christ Jesus. Any trust, however sacred or valuable, could be absolutely reposed in him. And in trial or danger, I was oft refreshed by his prayers. So, the power of the word of God, sovereignly used of God, should uh, throw in, in case I miss it, that you understand these early missionaries were all Calvinists. The fact that they had almost no response on Tanner didn't leave them to throw up their hands, left them to worship God. God has hid these things, wise and prudent. He reveals them to babes. God has his time, his place. These men were not superficial uh, evangelists. They were well-taught, grounded Christian preachers. Now, from the word of God, the value, it follows the importance of writing. And you know we forget this, don't we? What a wonderful thing that we can write words and read words. They had no writing, nothing at all. And on one of the first occasions that this dawned on some of them, Peyton was working away from where his wife was, half a mile or more away. He wanted to send a message to her. So he wrote it on a bit of wood. And he said to one of the natives, to take this, this message to my wife. The native looks at a bit of wood. Would no speak, he says. Would no message. No. Just take it, Peyton says, take it. So he takes it and then she reads, she gets a message. Words, a book. Well, then thoughts turn to scripture. Just a, is there a book that speaks? And this old chief Namaki, the first convert, he said, well, I, I'll help to with words. And this is what happened. He and Peyton, they worked on the New Testament and at length, at length, the book, the New Testament is there and the old chief says, make it speak, Missy, make it speak. And then as he began to handle it, he says, it does speak. It speaks my own language. Peyton had brought a printing press from Glasgow. He says how it's difficult to handle. It's quite intricate and he never used one before. But he says, I confess that I shouted in an ecstasy of joy when the first sheet came from the press correct. It was about one o'clock in the morning. I was the only white man then on the island, this was still on Tanner, and all the natives had been sound asleep for hours. Yet I literally pitched my hat into the air and I danced like a schoolboy round the printing press. Portion of God's word printed in a new language for the first time. And Peyton says, friends of the Bible, need not fear the effusions of the higher critics and the advanced view men and unbelievers. The word of the Lord endures forever. It is God's word, man's only infallible rule of faith and practice in all things. The book that converts cannibals and turns them into servants of God can change and convert any people. So that's the first lesson and how we need to prize the Bible. You young people, how important when you're young to memorize the Bible. Get the word of God into your hearts. It's a wonderful means of blessing to you and to everyone with whom God will put you in touch. And when we learn to know God through the Bible, we come to the knowledge of the person of God and the fear of God. And the fear of God is a fundamental lesson. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is clean. And it came with true conversions. It comes. And it came in these islands. So when they heard the Ten Commandments, instead of raising questions, they, they recognized God's holy law. And the Holy Spirit writes it on the hearts of converts. And so the Ten Commandments became a rule for life and for pleasing the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's Day in particular was wonderfully kept 
by these early Christians. So much so that when Peyton says, when I returned to so-called civilization and so, saw how the Lord's Day was abused in white Christendom, my soul longed after the holy Sabbaths of Aniwa. So, let me just give you these words too from Inglis, another of the missionaries. He says, I have no doubt but that the steady and rapid progress of the gospel on Anichum was due in no small degree to the manner in which we emphasized the scriptural doctrine of the Sabbath and established its observance. We thus secured time for religious instruction, quietness for devotional exercises, and the largest possible amount of social sympathy in the public services of the sanctuary, and above all, brought down upon us the influences of the Holy Spirit. In accordance with the divine promise, the exile of Patmos, too, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. A few headings. What do we prize next to the Bible? Christian homes. Christian homes. And that's what Grace did on Aniwa. And we have a Christian home. How thankful we should be for it. Sometimes when we're young, we don't appreciate what it means to have prayer, parents who pray and who love Christ. But it's a great privilege. And here on these islands, homes, real homes, were established for the first time. That's just a heading, and I move on to another heading. It, it meant a lot to Peyton and all these missionaries, the method that they used in the New Hebrides. And what was it? In a word, it was this. Put down a church. See that a church is established. Don't run here and there, speaking here and here. Establish a church. That church has got to be the throbbing center of life for communities. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a very important principle. The purity of the church. Make sure there's a church that stands out from heathenism. And that church will then become the life-giving center for others. That's a great lesson that stands out. His last letter from when he was at Aniwa in 1904, he says, talking about what the gospel had done, we now occupy 25 of 30 islands and have some 17,000 natives avowedly serving Jesus as their God and Savior. In the island of Aramanga, where Williams was killed, five missionaries were murdered, two of them devoured by cannibals, is now a Christian island. There are 300 communicants, 12 elders, 40 native teachers, and practically the whole population attending Sunday school. Look up Wikipedia, Vanuatu. I'm talking now, you understand, some years ago, but this island today is a place where the gospel continues, and uh, look up Wikipedia, Vanuatu. Very last point is that uh, all this took place because of the presence and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. A little village where Peyton was born in the south of Scotland, on the gates of the cemetery are these words, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. It's the work of Christ. And Peyton is absolutely sure that they would never have survived Christ's presence had not been given to them. When his wife died, his young bride on Tanner, he says, but for Jesus and the fellowship he gave me there, I must have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. Without the abiding consciousness of the presence and power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing else in all the world could have preserved me. It's a lot about that in the book. The book, the autobiography, is really about the work of Christ and the grace of Christ. The assurance was given to me, he said, as if a voice from heaven had spoken, that not a musket would be fired to wound me, not a club prevail to strike me or a spear to leave the hand, not an arrow leave the bow, without the permission of Jesus Christ, who is all power in heaven and earth. He rules all nature, animate and inanimate, and restrains even the savages of the southern seas. That's, that's the ground of it all. The Lord Jesus Christ was with them. Well, 
two words of application, especially for the young people. Terrible thing to think that this story teaches us it's a hard thing to be a Christian. That's exactly what the devil wants us to think. Oh, to be a Christian is to live a pretty narrow, unpleasant life. My friends, it's the exact opposite. This is a life of liberty and peace and joy. What good these Christians did. What blessing they knew. They were single-minded. There's a portrait of Peyton in Sydney and in Melbourne, and I've seen it. It's a fine portrait, but what I like best is the words underneath from Philippians 3. This one thing I do. That's the text. That's the life. That's the life that we need to covet. And when we're young, to commit ourselves to Jesus and to continue in that commitment all our days. And then a very last point is this. How important it is. You know the devil is a great boaster. And uh, if you just looked at our newspapers and our media, you would think, oh, what powers are reigning in the world of evil and darkness and how small and helpless and weak we are. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. All power in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus Christ. And when we are faced with the devil, what are we to do? We are to resist him. We are to resist him. We are to go for him. Heathenism. We are not just tremble and worry and fright one another and repeat depressing stories of what's happening. No. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We have the shield of faith. We have more than that. We have the promise that we won't go alone. So, we are not to be dismayed. We are facing real heathenism today. We are. But where does it come from? Not come from clever men or professors. No, it's come from the powers of darkness. Oh yes, and they are tremendous powers. But God has given us in Christ something more. The whole armor of God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. That's the truth. And we learn that truth by reading these fine old books. And now I'm done or I'm going to get into trouble for not stopping in time. Um, John G. Payton. Here's a good paperback copy. It's slightly abridged. So if you're a bit nervous about size, this is about $8. It's a abridged copy. Uh, John G. Payton, The Autobiography. Now if your appetite's a bit stronger and you like books that you can leave for your grandchildren. And by the way, don't mark them all in ink and so on, because they're going to be read for years to come. And uh, Use a pencil, please. That's just a little formal of mine. But anyway, this is the Banner of Truth edition. This is a complete work. It contains more than this edition. But uh, wonderful, wonderful reading. Wonderful reading. Not a book to be read once and forgotten, but a lifetime gift. And then... Uh, this is, don't start with this, but this is Margaret Payton's letters from the New Hebrides. Um, once you've got the picture, you may want to look at Margaret Payton. And some of you have read the autobiography, but not got to Margaret Payton. Uh, and then this little book, which isn't in the book room, but I mention it for parents. It's uh, published by Christian Focus, and it's called John G. Payton, South Sea Island Rescue. It's a good little short account, ideal for children, I guess, five, six, seven-year-olds, that sort of age. Uh, you can order it from a bookshop. Time has gone. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to Thee for all the grace given to Thy people through all the ages. And we confess with shame that too often we are faint-hearted and discouraged. Help us, O oh Lord, to have a new vision of Thy grace and power. We thank thee for multitudes brought into the kingdom of Christ from the South Sea Islands. Oh, we pray that thou wouldst grant us that vision and faith to know in this day that the powers of darkness can be overcome. Hear us, Lord, and continue to bless us in all our time together. We thank thee for this occasion. Commit our lives to thee. In Jesus' name, amen.